Chapter 22, Part 2, Cultural Conflict, Bubble and Bust, 1919-1932. So we're still in that Roaring Twenties era, heading towards this Great Depression. So post-World War I in America, you have a return to this idea of nativism. So what is nativism? The, the, uh, the genesis of nativism started in the 1830s, 40s. So it, it really is covered in the first half of the United States history class. But it comes back to life here. This idea of being anti-immigrant, uh, pro-Protestant, uh, you know, where you want to create immigration limits, not let just anybody come to this country. So it sounds like like today we, we have an immigration issue going on today. Uh, Donald Trump is accused by many of trying to return America to being nativist and uh, returning to the isolationism of years ago. So we talked about the isolationism of World War One, where America didn't want to get involved in, in European wars. We'll talk about it again when World War II approaches. It goes all the way back to the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 of not wanting to be involved in Europe's issues or problems. Truth is, the people that came to America came here to escape being European, to escape the ideologies and, and points of view and, and the oppression of the feudalist, feudalism and, and so on. So same type of thing. And, and in this era, you, you have the rise of minority groups and, you know, uh, getting getting credit for taking part in a war. But like we said in the first half, coming back home to more racial stripes, the same, same idea here. Uh, so Trump is accused of, of, of today of trying to take the country back or kind of want to put, you know, uh, walls up. You want to put kind of circle the wagons and, and, and internalize instead of being out in the world like like America has been as the world leader. OK, so um, the, the Ku Klux Klan uh, gets a resurgence in the 1920s. OK. Uh, because of this rise of nativism. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan is a perfect example of a nativist group. So let's do a supplemental lecture right here. We'll call this the demise of the KKK. This is number eight. So we've, this will be our last supplemental lecture before the midterm. So please be sure you have your one through eight notes together and in order and study those. So when you do your midterm, I'll remove two, but the, out of the remaining six, you can you can choose to write three, you can use your notes. So make sure that you have the notes together. And if you haven't done that, uh, I would suggest you go back through all these lectures and find these. They're randomly in there. And please don't ask me where they are. You should have been watching these videos from the beginning. But you can find them and get that in order, OK? So we're going to talk about the demise of the KKK. I'm looking at that more from today's lens in the 1920s, but it's relevant in the sense that the, the most powerful the KKK ever was, was in the 1920s. Looking at our, at our uh, outline, introduction, we'll see the rise of white nationalism. Uh, the KKK is the image that comes to mind when people think of white supremacy, but truly today, mostly small and disjointed compared to what it used to be. You still have the Knights of the KKK today, but usually outnumbered at demonstrations. So what are the issues on both sides? The issues are, are Confederate statues. You know, should they be um, publicly displayed? What 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 is that actually saying about that state if they're if they're um, you know putting them up them up and in in honoring that? Okay, the Confederate flag, same same type of thing. And then how Dylan Roof and what he did uh, adds to this already flammable situation. So today, the white supremacist movement is really all about the rise of the alt right, and we saw this a few years back. Uh, with the Charlottesville, Virginia uh, incident, where there was a, uh, you know, a protest and a, and a riot, and a woman was killed, uh, and the alt right kind of became prominent and, and heard of by by most of America for the first time. But truly, they have they have kind of taken the place of the KKK, and the KKK is mostly irrelevant today. So the relevance of the lecture, although the KKK is the image we think of when we hear of white supremacy groups. Today, they are largely ineffective. The alt-right has taken their place, OK? OK, let's, let's get started. So, so even though the extreme right and white nationalism it seems to be enjoying a revival because of Donald Trump, and that's not an accusation by me. That's, that's, a, that's a thought that's, you know, that's out there with a lot of people. It, the truth is that the Ku Klux Klan 
is a mere shadow of its once powerful former self today. So that's an interesting picture right there, right? Like, whoa. Now that's, of course, Photoshop, and that's the that's the thing about modern technology. You can't just assume what you see is really what you're seeing, okay? I doubt very seriously that Donald Trump ever posts, you know, for a picture like that, but this is what the what the uh you know the the, the witch hunters want to project is that this is who he truly is okay um but he is accused of bringing this nativist point of view back and this kind of this this racial hate and and bigotry you know he's accused of that but today the clan is mostly a collection of small disjointed groups no central leadership very little stability these clan groups tend to form and dissolve very quickly there are very few groups that have a long history of existence and in general, the Klan is not a particularly healthy white supremacist movement. This, this is a, a quote from Oren Siegel, the director of the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism. So I suppose he would know. But this idea, these, these images of men in these traditional white robes and the, and the hoods is what we think of. and still dredges up memories of burning crosses in, in people's front yards and public lynchings, you know, that was indicative of, of the Klan's heyday. But they still are around today. The Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, the loyal white knights, uh, you know, are still are still out there, still organized. But usually they're vastly outnumbered at, at their demonstrations or protests because hundreds of anti-racist counter-protesters come to, to you know, um, kind of uh, blur them out, okay? So what are the issues? What what's what is the conflict between between the uh, the, the KKK and the uh, anti-racist protesters? Well, a few things, and we hear about them every day now. This has been going on for more than a hundred years, but it's becoming very relevant today because of what's happening out there. Confederate statues should they be removed? Well, I mean, should they have ever been put up there? We don't in history you don't typically honor the losers of a battle, especially especially ones that uh, were proponents of slavery, but yet we do in this country. The, the South will rise again and, and the long lost world of, of, of honor and, and, and chivalry and when men were men and women were Southern Bells, the Scarlet O'Hara and the happy slaves. And this has been promoted since the end of the Civil War. And we, and we all have been drenched in it. It doesn't matter how old you are because it still goes on. We still tend to see the South, the old South, is viewed as a good thing. Well, if you're an African-American with your two kids in the park one day and Robert E. Lee's on a statue and your young kids say, Mommy or Daddy, who's that? What do you, what do you say? Well, he's, he's the man that, that was the head of the army that wanted to continue to enslave us. So this is where this issue comes from. Is it fair to have these symbols of racism, white supremacy, enslavement? bigotry uh, uh, in our public places. So this is where it comes from, of course, today, with all this going on, George Floyd and so on, they're, they're, they're now taking these statues down, people, mobs of people are. Uh, so it's a big deal. Um, so the Knights protest the removal of these statues, uh, but typically their speeches and denunciations are drowned out by the boos and jeers of the counter-protesters. But regardless of that, experts insist that the extreme right is on the rise in the United States, emboldened by Trump's victorious presidential campaign of 2016. And that this comes at a time when we were having important conversations about race. I mean, the, you know, Robin Lenhart, the director of the Center on Race, Law and Justice at Fordham Law School, you know, a renowned school in, in America, is, is suggesting you know, we were we were we were having breakthroughs or about to when then along comes this new wave of white nationalism and it's, it's somewhat derailed this this idea so this this is the conflict but uh and it goes further it's about you know, black lives matter why why is it that more blacks are under prison parole control in 2010 and that goes back a little bit but there's more there's more black men in prison today than there were black slaves in 1850. And people will say, well, the numbers are skewed. There wasn't it wasn't that large of a population back then. And and that's true. And I'm not trying to 
present this in that way. Just it's it's somewhat shocking to think. You, you just wouldn't think there were millions of slaves in 1850. You wouldn't think there'd be that many or more numbers of black men in, in prison, okay? This is also coming from Robin Robin Lenhart of the uh, of Fordham, and um, pointing to the mass incarceration of African Americans, the abuse of minorities by police, the you know, including these frequent high profile shootings that for the last six, seven, maybe ten years have seemed to be growing in number. Uh, these are all sensitive issues that that. You know, a lot of a lot of conservative white Americans would, would rather sweep under the rug. Don't let's not look at that. OK, uh, there's also the issue of the Confederate flags, same type of idea with statues. You know, you have these these flags and monuments and, and you know, Mississippi's being forced to take take the Confederate flag out of their state flag. Uh, they are the last southern state to do so. It's happening right now. A, a uh, popular football player said, I'm not going to play in the state of Mississippi when you have a Confederate flag flying above the stadium where I'm playing. You know, I'm black and I don't believe in that, so goodbye. And this caused the uproar and the state is now taking the stars and bars, they call it, out of their state flag. Uh, so so same, same type of issue. How, how, can you, how can you display these banners, you know, in, in a state that's, that's, uh, that's integrated. I mean, there's black and white people. So obviously a black person is going to feel different about this than a white person. It's a free country and, and where everyone should feel safe. Should you put this up to remind black people of the, of the past of the days of enslavement under the Confederacy? And then they went to war to, to continue that. Okay. Uh, so these are the issues, but it, but it's been increasingly challenged in the last few years and perhaps I wouldn't say starting with, but greatly emboldened by the actions of Dylan Roof, this very young man, white man, white supremacist, avowed white supremacist, and where he walked into the uh, a church in in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and opened fire and killed nine people, including the pastor and a state senator, 21 year old at the time, white supremacist. I mean, th these things are still going on in our in our communities, in our in our culture and societies, cities. Um, you know, what's, when's this going to stop? Uh, and of course, the, the shootings of young black men by the police. So, so going back to this whole idea of monuments and flags and what the big deal is, and people say, well, it's, if you're a white person, it's honoring my past, my history. And in many cases, that's true. And I don't think anyone's trying to suggest that you shouldn't honor your ancestors that fought for the Confederacy, just like many people that have you know, Nazis in their in their ancestry in the past. It doesn't mean that you dishonor them, but you don't necessarily uh, celebrate like, like we do here. So these monuments stand as markers or efforts to memorialize a period when, when white supremacy reigned. Uh, recently, a group of white nationalists had a public gathering in Washington, D.C., close to the Lincoln Memorial. Why would they do it by the Lincoln Memorial? Because Martin Luther King very famously gave us I have a dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and they're, they're trying to insult him by, by going there and saying the opposite. Okay. Uh, these, these kinds of things are still going on. And, you know, the, uh, the alt-right and this whole kind of wave of, of this new white supremacy is, is saying the opposite. There has been an awakening. This is Richard Spencer, a sworn enemy of multiculturalism and a leader of the self-proclaimed alt-right movement. There's been an awakening, and many credit Trump. And so I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that. I'm just saying that, that, that this, this movement is saying Trump has emboldened us with his, with his points of view and, and the rhetoric and the things that he does. Uh, so the alt-right, what is the alt-right? It's an online movement that uses websites, chat boards, and social media. It's, it's, uh, it's modern to spread its message. Most of its members are young white men who see themselves as champions of their own demographic. And they call themselves the tribe. You know, the white men is their tribe, as they call it. Uh, but interestingly, their greatest points of unity is in what they are against. So what are they against? Multiculturalism, immigration, feminism, and above all, 
political correctness. The alt-right is gaining momentum right now and is trying to draw together the different elements of the white American nationalist identity, which it claims is under threat from globalization and immigration. So against that backdrop today, the Ku Klux Klan are, are seen very much seen as, as a sort of an older generation white supremacy. So they are not attracting young members to the degree that they were many years ago. They suffer from a lack of cohesion. Much of their activity is putting flowers on people's lawns, in, in which in many ways is a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. So this is this is the old school way of doing things, you know, in the 20s or even in the 60s, 50s. It's different, a different world today with instant communication. The alt-right is taking advantage of that. The KKK is not. So they are they are diminishing in, in strength and, and clout. Uh, but understand, in our era, 1920s, the KKK reached its peak even, even more than the post-Civil War era. Four, four million people uh, were uh, four, four million people were members of the KKK. That's that's a huge number. In that era, in that era, they were well organized and, and wielded considerable political clout even reaching at times into the law enforcement agencies. I mean, come on, really? There's much evidence of that, that many of the local police departments in the South, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even maybe a little bit further, was staffed by members of the KKK, okay? But today, it can only muster uh, 55 to 106,000 members. Uh, not like it used to be at all. This is according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which monitors extremist groups. So the relevance of the lecture, although the KKK is the image we think of when we hear of white supremacy groups today, they are largely ineffective. The alt-right has taken their place. Okay. Okay, that is the end of that supplemental lecture number eight, the demise of the KKK. Uh, I'm going to continue on to just just to talk a lot about a little bit more, but understand that lecture is over now. So just, just keep your review, your your essay about the lecture, you know, limited to what I say in, in the lecture itself. Uh, so the alt right uh, came to prominence nationally with the incident in Charlottesville, where they were marching through the University of Virginia with tiki torches to to look like the old KKK. Brought a lot of anger out of a lot of people, and you had this huge uh, riot. And a woman was killed when a when a vehicle drove through a crowd and, and hit her. Okay, uh, so they gained a lot of publicity by doing this, but perhaps it backfired on them. Uh, so the the supplemental lecture talked about the diminishment of the KKK. The truth is, the alt right as an organization, their their fortunes have kind of apparently diminished also since the Charlottesville incident. Uh, it might not be the 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 uh, direction that you thought it it it, it, it is. They they they've somewhat uh, you know been been hurt by that publicity. So let's watch our next film. The alt right is in shambles one year after Charlottesville. Of course, it's been it's been I think three years now. So the film's a couple of years old. Uh, this is a raw kind of video. Um, understand that there's some profanity in here. You know, I don't want to teach a sanitized version of history. I want to teach you the truth, but I do have to tell you that uh, there is profanity in here and words that, you know, you don't want to be using, okay? This is uncensored. This is an uncensored clip from an HBO special. So please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so we're talking about modern times. We're talking about the rise of an organization that's about hate and about bigotry and about you know, segregation and racism. So it's it's hard to imagine, but here we are in our present day still fighting this the same the same thing that was happening in the 20s and all, of course all the way back through all of American history. But let's go in a different direction, going back to our era. Um, this is the era called the Harlem Renaissance, 1919-1929, so post-war. Many African Americans came north, the Great Migration resulted in more blacks coming north because of the opportunity for factory jobs left vacant by white men who went to fight the war. So many African-Americans came north, leaving the South for the first time. And we talked about this before. 
to get away from not from Jim Crow and and lynchings and all this kind of you know life that you had to deal with this this psychological warfare of trying to stay alive come north for, to to get away from that but for opportunity also so you have this renaissance period of of in the African American communities in the north uh. So the Harlem Renaissance. So Harlem is a black community that was in, it still is in New York City. Uh, but in, in this era, many black artists, writers, intellectuals, musicians, jazz, created an identity that was all there. It's for the first time, you have an identity of African Americans in the United States that wasn't slavery or, or yes, massa or stepping off the sidewalk or you know, uh, segregated drinking fountains and restaurants and, you know, sit in the back of the bus, you come to New York and they start this, this renaissance where they, where they flourish as a, as a culture and people, of course, take notice. And, and a lot of things come out of this, you know, uh, modern music and literature and all, all kinds of positive th things. So for the first time, uh, with, with the exception of when they were in a community of slaves on a plantation where they come together when the when the when the uh, masters and his family were were home for the evening that's the only time slaves had community for the first time you have you have the african american community creating a solidarity of purpose that had little to do with being from the south let's watch this film uh entitled the harlem renaissance i'll go ahead and watch that and come on back so you have this rise of of uh, you know African American uh, agency in, in moving forward and not not you know worried about what what I should be doing to please the white man. We're going to do what we want to please ourselves. Marcus Garvey became the next leader of the African American thought and movement. So we've gone from Booker T. Washington, who fell from grace, to W.E.B. Du Bois, who brought this idea you know, forward that it's about discrimination, not inferiority. And now Marcus Garvey, uh, as we come in, into our era, becomes the new leader of the Black Civil Rights Movement. So very, very, very charismatic from, from Jamaica. And he calls for a return to the roots of people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and cultures like a tree without roots. African Americans should get back to their roots. He creates the United Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, very similar to the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He promotes separatism. He's he's more radical. Uh, the new Negro has no fear. We've come north. We've we've gained. We don't have the the uh, Jim Crow uh, white crackers. Uh, pursuing us in our beds and burning down our houses. We're north now. We we have set a, set a, a our own kind of agenda. Uh, so it's confidence. It's it's growth, and he pushes for separatism. Uh, and also, uh, so separate from what? Separate from white America, but also that African Americans in the United States should move back to Africa. Uh, because you'll never be treated fairly in the white United States. There have been talks about doing that. Abraham Lincoln talked about doing that during the Civil War. When the war is over and the North wins, maybe we should send all the Af all the freed slaves, African Americans, back to Africa, and of course, you know, finance them and 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 fund them until they get on their feet. Of course, many uh, many African American leaders at that time said, "We've been here as long as you have. We're as American as you are. Why would you suggest sending us back to Africa? None of us have a have an association with Africa. We've been here for for a couple hundred years." But here's here's a here's a black man suggesting the same idea all those all these years later. He also promotes Pan Africanism, an ideology, the belief that all Africans. Those in the country of Africa and those in diaspora were united and shared the same fate. So the idea that, that African Americans have a common heritage and destiny and they should cooperate and pursue political action amongst themselves. So, so Garvey understood the, the power of politics to gain a power. If you have to have that, that you need to gain a political power. So, so what is this word diaspora? And you'll hear it pronounced uh, diaspora. I, I believe that diaspora is the correct way to say it, but you, you'll, you'll hear both. 
it means to scatter about. But in in the case of African Americans, uh, African peoples scattered from their homeland to places across the globe, spreading their culture as they went. Of course, in this case, they didn't scatter because they wanted to. They scattered because they were they were kidnapped and forced to. But but Garvey's point of view is they originate from the same place, Africa. That's your roots, okay? Uh, so he so he uh, promotes this idea of of returning to your roots. That the African Americans need to return to who they who they are, you know, deep deep down inside. Okay, different direction here. That in the twenties you have the, the the a huge rise of the consumer culture. So we've seen this before. The, the you know the industrial revolution started one. It, there was one in the 1700s. I mean, this is something that continues to grow. And of course, we, we live in this world today. But post World War One, and this somewhat affluent era that that the economy is booming. You know, more and more people have more money, and you buy buy more and more things. So this consumer culture blossomed like never before. Uh, advertising flourished and took off, and this continuation of marketing to women because they have the free time, they have the disposable income, they can afford, you know, housekeepers and servants, and they're out in the world spending their husband's money that he's making from being middle managers. Remember, remember the middle manager jobs? Uh, but understand, so I'm gonna, you're gonna watch the film, 1920s Consumer Culture, but understand that this was also only available to the upper middle class and upper class of whites, the, the uh, working class, uh, especially people of color were not taking, you know, able to take part in this, in what you're going to see in this film. Let's go ahead and watch the film. This idea of keeping up with the Joneses. We are the Joneses. Keep up if you can. People are real funny. They spend money that they don't have to buy things that they don't need in order to impress people they don't like. It sounds like today, right? Uh, so, this creates opportunity, though, for women. Post-war, they've proven themselves that they could do the job of a man in a factory. They get the vote because of that. Now, now they go they they go to work because we need to make more money to keep up with and afford the lifestyle of the twenties. We want to keep up with the Joneses. We want to appear affluent to our neighbors. So status became important. You know, people go into major debt just to uphold appearances. So again, 1920s, it's the same thing 100 years later, same country. Uh, Hollywood, I've mentioned before, uh, you know, pr pr promoted this idea of white wealth and flappers and, 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 you know, chauffeurs and limousines and champagne and just fun, fun, fun. It wasn't exactly the way everybody was living, but it was promoted that way. So they became very iconic and influential in the 20s and, of course, continue to be today. Uh, but back to back to women, it, it gave them a, a chance and, a, and a, a new identity, and they broke out of their of their mold. And we talked about the flappers before: uh, short skirts, bare legs, uh, makeup, out drinking, spending money, fashionable. Fashion becomes important. Independent, sexually active, more than perhaps one partner. Uh, they listen to jazz music. Uh, so this is this is somewhat the flavor of this 1920s, but the economy, if you were looking, of course, we don't like to look at these things. We, the same thing happened in 2008 when you have an economic downturn, but the economy is showing signs of disrepair. People were flooding the stock market. Uh, it was believed that you can't lose. Just, just throw all your money to the stock market and you're going to make big, big money. The, the problem with that is it creates precarious levels. If you own a stock and it's skyrocketing up, you should sell it because it's going to come skyrocketing down. doesn't mean it was a bad stock. It just means that people, when a stock starts to fly up, people sell to, to, to get their profit. So it drops back down. If that happens all the way across the board, it can cause an economic <clears throat> downturn that's hard to you know, get around. <clears throat> people are... are trading on the margin where you kind of borrow money to increase your shares and that's nice when the market's rising but can go against you quickly and break you if the market plunges so this is what happened uh the market crashed black sunday october 29th 1929 uh, the market crashed and in a panic and 
all this consumer spending, consumer culture and everything just stopped abruptly, making things worse and the economy faltered. Uh, watch our next film, uh, 1929 Wall Street Stock Market Crash. Please watch that film and come on back. Okay, so the Great Depression begins in the early 30s. So suddenly this, this uh, free-for-all, uh, fun times, you know, party, party, 1920s, roaring 20s is over. Just boom, like that. It, it goes from one way to another. And uh, a, the Depression uh, uh, steps in. And industrial production drops 37%. That's an incredible number. But listen to this. The building industry drops 78%. So for those of you that remember 12 years ago, 2008, we had a similar thing happen in, in, in the United States back then, two, uh, 12 years ago, uh, when uh, the economy dropped tremendously. And in, in San Diego, we, we live on two industries, uh, uh, tourism and the building industry and both nobody was flying anywhere nobody could afford any homes so suddenly there was no building going on it used to be you couldn't go down a street anywhere in the county and not find some sort of construction project underway but it was just over it's back now but this is what happens so 78 percent is a lot prices for products were cut in half well that's a good thing for consumers except the people that have that business go out of business okay you can't you can't sell things for less than what you bought them for. You go out of business. Uh, so this is an epic collapse never seen since. And until, you know, 2008, there hadn't been anything like it. Um, and and people do what they've got to do to survive. And, uh, you know, you you uh, kind of circle the wagons again. And, and it's it's somewhat like the like the. Uh, of 1873 that stopped the reconstruction movement you stopped caring about social causes and and the uh you know the the welfare of other people or people of color or women or whatever it might be because you're worried about yourself now you got to pay your mortgage you lost your job you got to pay for your car how do you do that so you start to you know uh internalize and, and, and pull away. And, every, and when everybody does that, of course, what happens? It, it, it gets worse. So this era of the, the depression, you know, is where you first see this, this, this idea uh, of soup lines. And, and here you see a very interesting image on the, on the left, the world's highest standard of living. There's no one like the American way, yet they're all standing in line for free meals because they don't have jobs. So on the on the left you've got African Americans, on the right you've got white Americans. It's happening to everybody across the board. It didn't, didn't, wasn't a racial thing; it, it affected everybody. Uh, and you have people going door to door working for food. You know the idea. And my grandmother used to tell me about stories um, when she she had a, a big home in in the Pittsburgh area, and people would come to her door and knock and can I. Can I weed your garden for a sandwich? Can I take that trash out for you for a, an orange? I mean, anything to eat. So this idea of, well, work for food that you might see on the free, uh, freeway on-ramps and off-ramps today, that, that, that's not new to our era. This goes back almost 100 years. People were you know, work, men doing anything they could to to uh, survive. And you, you, you kind of lose your your idea of... of uh, you know, this, I'm too good for this when you're hungry. Okay, so the so people of that era become very frugal. They, under, they understand the value of a dollar. Um, you know, you just don't simply spend money, you know, frivolously. So if you were brought up by people that came from the Depression, and I was, by the way, this is how they were. They don't want to spend a cent because they're afraid that they won't have one tomorrow. Even, even though that, the, the, Depression was years ago, and we're living in good times. Doesn't matter. They still think this way. Simple living, resourceful, frugal. Don't be wasteful. Be efficient. Save your money. You know, don't 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 be silly. Be be serious. It's this is of course the start of the what will what will erupt into the the conflicts of the 1960s are, are the values of, of these depressionary people, and then their children come. A generation later, and and you have a, a a conflict. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit, just give you a little bit of a preview, okay? 
So this is the depression. It begins and it and it changes America and uh, blots out this this carefree deck of the 1920s. Okay. Okay. That is the end of uh, chapter 22. Thank you.